So the British got their plunder. They got the cadets here. I don't know about the guns down uh, over at the John Chad house. They were probably more mobile than these guns. Uh, they probably hitched them up and out they went. Uh, but uh, Washington did have some field pieces, not very many when he left here. He did have some ammunition and he had his wagons. He, he knew when to stay and he knew when to go. He was, he was a very uh, a decent commander. Washington himself was a very sportly man, as they say. He had a mouth that looked like it had no teeth. He was a tall man. He was about as tall as me or an inch taller. I'm 6'1". He was 6'1 or 6'2". Now the average Continental soldier back then was a short guy. They didn't eat very well. They weren't big. Now Washington stood out like a sore thumb. His hats and all his paintings, it's not really a tri-quarter hat. It's more of a flat side French hat that's really tall. If you see the painting, him crossing the, uh, the Trenton to go to Trenton across the Delaware, that's what his hat would have looked like. And his aides de camp would have looked just like him. They would have had really nice uniforms. They would have had polished buttons. They would have had the best healthy horses. And they stood on this ridge and they knew they, they, those people. They, they, they knew them. Another account about this battle also, uh, we were talking about the Kenneth, uh, the Kenneth Meeting House, was that Patrick Ferguson. Now Patrick Ferguson was at this point also. He was down at the John Chad House earlier. Now he crossed too. I mean everybody came across the Brandywine. He had a green uniform on. Patrick Ferguson was a smart man. He was, uh, you know, he was, um, he was very intelligent, well schooled, well dressed, and he even invented his own rifle. There's some accounts they don't know yet that when he crossed the Brandywine, probably around about uh, a half a mile to my right, Washington was down there. He was trying to see where the British were coming across. He was on horseback. He was straddling his horse. Patrick Ferguson saw this officer on top of his horse. He said he looked like he had garlets, epaulets, he had arm patches. He looked like a very portly man. So Patrick Ferguson, being an aristocrat, pointed his rifle at him. The guy on the horseback had his back towards him. Now, there's accounts about him not taking the shot. It was an easy shot, he said, with the Ferguson rifle. It was a rifle-barreled gun. It was new. It could hit somebody at about 300 yards. He said that it, the man was 50, 50 yards away from him, an easy shot for Patrick Ferguson. So basically, the officer turned. Patrick Ferguson said to him, said, stop, stop, stop. The man on the horse didn't go. He didn't run. He just walked away slowly. Patrick Ferguson lowered his rifle. He said, I couldn't shoot such a, uh, an indignant man on a horse. It was uncouth or un, un, uncool, as we call it today, to kill somebody that didn't even do anything to me. That's how these people were, some of the people. And they say that some accounts that that was Washington. He could have been killed on this battlefield. That would have ended the war. They could have had a, a, another commander take over and surrender. So anyway, about Patrick Ferguson also. He crossed here. After the encounter, he crossed. For most accounts, he was down here. He was down by that John Chad house where that cannonball hit that spring house. And during that time, there was a lot of Pennsylvanians up here firing down before they retreated. He was shot right here in the elbow. He must have been running with his rifle. He got hit here in his elbow, broke his arm. Now he was out of the action. He couldn't pick up his weapon anymore, and he was out. And uh, for many years to come after that, he was killed in King Mountain, uh, but he suffered from that injury for about a year to, to a year and a half, and that was sustained here in the Battle of Brandywine. Now a couple other uh, uh, informations about this area is that uh, this ridge, like I said, it extends for a long distance. Uh, if you're at a high school about two miles away, you could see the defenses at Chad's Ford. He picked this area very well. He picked it because it had water, natural defense. And where we're standing right now is a ridge. See that house? That house goes off the ridge. It had a natural ridge line that they keep stationed troops here. And he also had a line of retreat.
Now, a line of retreat is extremely important. These are the things you have to think about when you're fighting uh, a different type of warfare than we fight today. <coughs> Excuse me. A line of retreat was an open field behind you that I can run the hell out of here. And from where I'm standing behind me is all farmland. It would have been farmland for the eye could see. If you guys ever go to, uh, um, if you're in Pennsylvania, you go to Lancaster Township, you'll notice that uh, it's all open farmland. You could see for as far as the eye could see in Lancaster. That's how it would have been here. So when the Pennsylvanians retreated, they retreated up Route 1, which is right over to my right. They stayed along the road, and during that time, they were met by a whole caravan of other people retreating. You had people that were locals, that didn't know if the British were nice, that they were going to plunder them, they were going to steal their property. There's accounts of wagons being loaded up with gold, silver, uh, different uh, items like that, that were loaded and brought up Route 1 by the locals because they didn't want their treasure taken by the British, because the British were going to be in this area really damn fast. So as they're retreating up Route 1, a couple of the field pieces go up with them. Now up on the route, about three miles to my north on uh, Baltimore Pike, there's an intersection. It's called 202 and Route 1. Now that's where the battle, they pulled their cannons to that point, whatever they had left, and the British were following them. Now, as they're running from this position, they didn't make a second or third line. They didn't have time to. There wasn't enough men. They were extremely scared at that point because they knew that there was another battle coming. They could hear it. <coughs> so basically, another uh, interesting uh, uh, aspect, too, was that we were talking about the Grenadiers. Now, they were lost in the woods up north. They, uh, they were placed all the way on the right-hand side of the line. Now, that line up at Birmingham was miles, about a mile and a half long. The Grenadiers got lost in the woods, Worcester's Woods. They emerged out of the woods right here, right here on the Pennsylvanians. They didn't know that, but they were headlong right into them. That's why the Americans couldn't form. They were getting outflanked by the Grenadiers that are uh, absolutely professional soldiers. They weren't shot at, they weren't killed. The Grenadiers were basically uh, lost. When you're lost, you're not getting shot at. You're not in the battle. When they were here, they were in the battle. Anthony Wayne was smart. He knew that the Grenadiers were coming. He saw the bearskin caps. He heard the music, which was really stupid at the time. These guys played music. They stepped and marched in music. You hear the music, you're out of here. The Grenadiers came to this position where I'm at too, on top of this ridge, maybe a little further down on my left. They pushed the Pennsylvanians up to Route 202 and Route 1. And during that time along that route, uh, they saw the rest of their army. They saw that uh, the reinforcements that had left on the left were retreating also from Dilworth Town. So basically, the war was over. It was over in this area. The British had outflanked them on the left. They, out, they, they came across Chad's Ford in the front. They took our field pieces. And we didn't form here, we left. We got out of here quick, because like I said, it was getting dark. Uh, we had a hell of a day shooting here. And there's some accounts here also that some sharpshooters were in this area. They were some of the men that came over the creek that were over at uh, the Kenneth Meeting House. That when the sharpshooters got here, they had fun. Some accounts say that there was a couple sharpshooters that were sitting in a, a barley patch in front of the, uh, the John Chad House picking guys off on the other side of the creek. Now from where I stand and where I look across that creek from that house, that's a good 400, 500 yards. And they were picking guys off. These are some of the accounts uh, before the British got here uh, of people dying. But like I said before about the Birmingham Meeting House, about other destruction, the redoubt would be here. Uh, they took the field pieces from here. Uh, after the, the battle, the farmers came in probably removed some of the, the items. They kept uh, you know, the cannonballs or whatever as, as trophies. 